Our second stop in the study of exponential and logarithmic functions is properties of exponential functions. Now, exponential functions are based on a basic form that is f of x equals a times b to the x minus h plus k. Now, this function is similar to other functions in the following ways. When we look at our value a, this is vertical stretch. The same way other functions have a as being their vertical stretch. If a is a value greater than 1, it becomes taller. If it's between 0 and 1, it acts as a compression, it shrinks it. And if a is less than 0, it will reflect across the x-axis. h is our horizontal shift. This will move our function right and left across the x-axis and basically comes down to the same thing we've worked with in other forms. What does it take to make this group, the exponent x minus h, zero? Our last item is the value k which acts as our vertical shift. If k is positive, it will move it up the y-axis. If it is negative, it will move it down. Now, as spoken of in the previous lesson, all these graphs of exponential functions have an asymptote, a value that they do not reach. If k is a number other than 0, then our asymptote will increase or decrease to match the value of k. And that becomes either the ceiling or the floor of our function, depending on which way it goes. All these are based around the overall parent function of f of x equals b to the x. b, if you'll remember, being a value greater than 1, will make it grow. And if it's between 0 and 1, it will make it shrink. So we're going to be building off of this basic core idea. So let's take a look at some examples of transformations. We need to describe the transformation of the parent function to that of the function shown. So if we have y equals a negative one-half times 5 to the x, our parent function here is f of x equals 5 to the x. So how do the other items in here play out for our transformations? Well, the only item we have is a different a value, which does the following. Since our a value is between 0 and 1, it will show a vertical compression by that factor of 1 half. And then since it is negative, it will have a vertical reflection across the x-axis. Our second function we're looking at here is y equals 4 to the x plus 2. Our parent function, f of x equals 4 to the x has that plus 2 added on to it. So what does that do to our function overall? Well, it provides us with a horizontal shift left two units because in order to make this group of x plus 2 equal to 0, x would have to be negative 2, so that is left two units. Now for our third function, y equals 7 times 3 to the x plus 1. Our parent function is f of x equals 3 to the x. This, all of these are showing growth because they have a b value greater than 1. And then what transformations are happening here as we go along? Well, we will end up with a vertical stretch by a factor of 7 a vertical shift of 1 with the asymptote being moved to y equals 1 as well. So these transformations can occur in any combination and simply moves the starting point and the extremes of our graph. So when we're dealing with exponential functions, it's typical to think that we always have to have a base number that is an integer and everything we've seen here supports that. But when we start getting into exponential and logarithmic functions especially, we can have bases that are irrational. The most common 
irrational base to have is the number e. Now the number e has the following approximate value. It is approximately 2.718281828486 and it repeats. The number e is similar to the number pi, it is an infinite non-repeating decimal. Now it can be found by using the formula 1 plus 1 over n all raised to the n power. Now as n gets larger and larger it's going to approach a limited value and that limited value is the number e. So when we're dealing with e, a lot of this becomes calculator work, and we simply fill in values that associate with it. So if we take e and raise it to the zero power, like any other number raised to the zero power, we get a value of 1. Rounding our answers to three decimal places, or four decimal places, let's go, e to the first would be 2. 0.7183 e squared would be 7.3891 e cubed would be 20.0855 and e to the fourth would be 54.5981 and it will continue to grow with different values. Now, as you go through and use E, it will take on different meanings and become more comfortable. But it is a, an irrational, infinite, non-repeating decimal. But we can take any number and raise it to an exponent. The purpose of E comes in when we have things that happen continuously at a specific rate. So if you're dealing in biology and you have a bacteria specimen that grows at a certain rate, at any given time you should be able to figure out how many specimens you have in your sample using an E value. A very common method for using E though is in the world of finance. So let's look at a real life situation. According to an August 6, 2012 article by ABC News, the average American spends about $14.40 a week, or $1,100 a year, on coffee at stores and restaurants. This is over and beyond what is consumed at home. So we're talking about going to restaurants, uh, kiosks, drive-up windows, um, your basic fast food places, and the almighty Starbucks that seems to be in every location. If a sophomore, typical age for somebody studying Algebra 2, 16 years old, were to save the money spent on coffee for one year and invested in a simple savings account that paid 5% interest compounded continuously, how much would be in that account the per when the person finished college at the age of 22, when they turned 30, typical age of settling down into career and at the end of their career at the age of 65. So we need to be able to write an equation and the basic equation that is used is A of T, the future value of an investment given a certain amount of time, equals the principal amount times E to the rate times time exponent. Rate is given in exponential, I'm oh, sorry, in decimal form. So in our situation here, we have P equaling $1,100. E is its own value. Our rate of 5% translated into decimal is 5 hundredths. And our time is going to be six years, 14 years, and 49 years. We're going to run three different situations. So first we're going to write our equation. 
a of t equals 1100 times e to the 0 0.05 t power. And we're going to go through and calculate for different t values and what a of t would be with those. We're looking at t values of 6, 14, and 49. Now bear in mind with all these we are simply investing one year's worth of money and then not touching it. We're never adding any money to the account and we're never taking anything from it. We're just relying on a constant 5% interest rate being paid continuously. So at the end of six years our $1,100 investment would come back as $2,215.13. More than doubles just sitting there doing nothing. After 14 years, the age of 30, when, like I said, normally college is done, career has been established, and settling in for patterns of life that are going to be happening. Oh, sorry, scratch this last value. At the end of six years, it was $1,484.84. At the end of 14 years was when we come up with the $2,215.13. Now if you can leave this money alone from the age of 16, putting it in an account, just leaving it there, all the way through the age of 49, sorry, the age of 65, 49 years later when you retire from work, your simple $1,100 investment will now be worth $12,748 and 18 cents. That's a good retirement vacation or fun activities to be done now that you have the remainder of life left ahead of you. As we go through and work with items of continual uh, continuous compounding and interest payment, you have the situation where at every moment your money's increasing slightly or your population's increasing slightly. And you're going to encounter a time all the way through this where you're being paid money on the money that was already been given to you or the population's increasing from the increase that's already happened. So if you can take items and just leave them be, the return is great. And the higher the interest or rate of return, the quicker these changes can be seen. So the properties of exponential functions follow the same as those we've studied of other functions and just need a little bit of work to be done with them. Study this, make sure you understand the concepts and how they work, and we'll work on being able to graph and display this information visually.